Welcome to today's episode of the 2020 Awards Podcast. Sitting here in the uh, Wonder Bread studios with us is Brian McDonald. Uh, he's a filmmaker and screenwriter. He's an author. Uh, he's written several books on storytelling, including Invisible Ink, The Golden Theme, and most recently Ink Spots, which is a compilation of essays from his Invisible Ink blog, as well as his uh, his screenplay Freeman, which is available in novella form. Is that what you call it? And novella in screenplay form. So almost what I said. Um, anyway, welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you. God, feels like I just saw you. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. No, it wasn't. <laughs> um, Wait, where did Brian get here? <laughs> uh, he just got here. Oh, okay. Hey, Brian. Hey. Yeah, I didn't see you sneak in. You're like a ninja. I am. Uh, the, the person you hear chatting there is uh, is our producer, Lee Christofferson. Hello. And, and, uh, and Chris is here, too. That's me. So, uh, Brian, as I said, you're a filmmaker and screenwriter. You're a member of the voting syndicate. What are the five scripts that you think are worth uh, a nomination from 93? So you want me to just do, a, do the yeah, just name the five just Name first? the five, and then right. we'll, we'll, we'll right. go through them. Okay. Uh, Schindler's List, Searching for Bobby Fischer, Groundhog Day, The Fugitive, and Dave. First up is, is Dave, starring Kevin Klein and Sigourney Weaver. Uh, Kevin Klein plays two roles, um, plays American President Bill Mitchell and his doppelganger, Dave Kovic, who runs a temporary employment agency. And uh, when President Mitchell slips into a coma while he's cheating on his wife, Sigourney Weaver, Dave is brought in to impersonate him. And at first, he's just supposed to attend the events and smile, but eventually starts starts fixing the country. And, uh, and the screenplay was written by Gary Ross. So... What is it about Dave that that you think is worth? Dave is one of those movies that is um, it's a it's fun, and so people forget that somebody had to write it, and it was just as hard to write as something that wasn't fun or you know funny. Um, and I'm glad you're bringing that up because I feel like just because it's a comedy, it it gets dismissed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the writing's not hard or something. Right. But you know, Gary Ross is is a brilliant writer and writes things that aren't like that at all. Um, and he has a way of taking, he even talks about this, an idea that sounds corny. <laughs> like all his ideas, like if you pitch them, they would sound like really corny. This guy's going to impersonate the president. Yeah. Yeah. But he has a way of executing them that is really amazing and making you care about the people involved. Um, and taking something fantastical and making it so that you believe that it's happening. It's also, it's unbelievably well plotted, like the plot makes sense and, and in terms of just the mechanics of it. But but you really do care about the characters. You care about Dave. You believe in that guy. He's kind of the, the fantasy president. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, he is. Well, he's just a good guy. Yeah, he's just a good guy. <laughs> and his heart's in the right place. Well, he yeah. looks for, he finds people jobs. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. He finds Which people jobs. Which is what you want the president yeah. to do. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and... um uh, there are just some really nice human moments in it. Uh, there's a there's a scene I like with Ben Kingsley where he's talking about when he's got started in politics, and it's just a small moment that um, that grounds it. I think a lot of times the comedies now have no grounding. Every right. every moment is silly. Every character is crazy, and so you know it used to be an idea that you would have. An ordinary person in extraordinary circumstances, or you'd have an extraordinary person in ordinary circumstances, and now it's extraordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. <laughs> you know, yeah. and so nothing is happening. It's just yeah. all goofy all the time. Yeah. And with a moment of reality because they go, oh, I gotta you gotta care about the characters, so we'll have one sad moment and then back to the goofy. And this isn't like that, you know. Yeah. Um it it has serious moments all the way through and it's yeah, its point is always serious. There's uh, a lot of really nice scenes. There's the one with Dave and his secret servant, service agent. Oh, yeah. Games, it's but he's great. looking at all the old pictures like, there you are. Yeah. There you are. You should wear more, you know, yeah, yeah, vests. Yeah, 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 I know. He's like, yeah, okay. There's also the thing where, 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 you know, Dave's an imposter, right? He's not really the president. Yeah. And he's talking to the secret service guy. I think his name's Dwayne. And he's talking to the secret service guy. And he says, uh, so... Uh, you have to take a bullet for the president? Would you really take a bullet for the president? And he nods that he would, and he goes, so I guess that means you'd have to take a bullet for me. And they leave it, 
Right. And then at the end of the thing, yeah. end of the movie, yeah. he says, "I, I would have taken, I, I would have taken a bullet for you, Dave." And it's really great. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> scene. I'm kind of getting goosebumps just. To see and, and also, I mean, it has so much to say about the silliness of politics and the the scene where you know he wants to save. There's a couple of great scenes. One where he calls uh, his accountant Charles Grodin in. He yeah. pulls up in this clunker car and he comes in yeah. and he's looking through the books and he's just like, "How does this?" Who's doing these? <laughs> yeah. And he, he tries to, and they have the, they have their cabinet meeting, and he's like, "Well, can we cut this program? What, what program is this?" And it's like, "Oh, it's to make people feel good about their cars." <laughs> and so Dave's like, "So we're spending this many millions of dollars so people feel good about a car they already bought? Yeah, yeah. Like, is that more important than saving this preschool? <laughs> yeah. Would you say it is? Yeah." Do you want to say that to an eight-year-old kid or whatever? Right, 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 yeah. No, Mr. Yeah. President, I don't. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, it's really. Let's cut that one. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's and also it's there's a nice there's nice visuals in terms of storytelling. Really nice visual storytelling that people forget about, but really beautiful. There's a scene at the beginning which I love, and I, I show it in my classes when I'm teaching visual storytelling. It's at the very beginning. The president's helicopter lands on the lawn of the White House, and he and the first lady get out, and they're holding hands, and then they. Somebody hands them the, the, the leash to the two. They have these two corgis, and they're, like, waving to the crowd right. and the paparazzi or whatever you call them in their press, I guess. And they go into the White House, and the second that the president goes into the White House, without even looking, he throws the leash to some, <laughs> some, you know, some flunky, like, without even thinking about it. And he goes one way, and the first lady goes another way, yeah. and you go, well, that's their relationship. And that's yeah. immediately. That's yeah. right at the Just, beginning. That's all the setup you needed. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. And they don't say a word to each other. They right? don't say a yeah. word to yeah. each other. It's, it's better they gorgeous. don't. Gorgeous. Yeah. yeah, it's really gorgeous. And, and also, we know the president's a dick because he doesn't like dogs. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So it Everything's says there. two things about this man we know. Yeah. And later, when it's fake, the fake president, he's like rolling on the ground with dogs and right. having a good time with the dogs. Yeah. yeah, really, really nice. Uh, next up, mm -hmm. The Fugitive. Yeah. Uh, a thriller based on the 1960s TV series of the same name. Uh, Dr. Richard Kimball, played by Harrison Ford is wrongfully convicted of the murder of his wife, escapes from federal custody, and uh, he's declared a fugitive, hence the title. Uh, he sets out to prove his innocence and bring those who are responsible to justice while being pursued relentlessly by a team of U.S. Marshals led by uh, Deputy Samuel Gerard, played by a cantankerous Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, the screenplay was written by Jeb Stewart and David Toohey, and um, you think it's worth a nomination. Why? I think it's worth a nomination because, again, it's... It's fun to watch, and so it looks like that's easy to write. But in well, fact, they already had the TV show. They already had the TV show, and it's a lot like the TV show. If you watch the TV show, mm -hmm. the, the, but you know, I don't know how much Roy Huggins, Roy Huggins created the TV show, and he has a credit on the movie as a producer. And I'm not sure how much he had to do with the movie, but it really has his fingerprints all over it. And um, there's, it's it. Yeah, they're, you're chasing a guy. It's a chase thing. Oh, one guy, you know, whatever. But there's something they do that's really nice, and they do it on the TV show a lot, too. And that is they make you care about Richard Kimball over and over again, and they let you know he's a good guy. And one of the ways they do that is something uh, that used to be called to pet the dog, have a pet the dog scene or pet mm -hmm. the dog. Now it's called Save the Cat. But it's the same, <laughs> it's the same thing. But when I learned it, it was pet the dog. So, and... What it is, is you always see that he is a good person. So you know he didn't murder his wife. You know it. And uh, there's a scene at the very beginning where uh, they're taking the bus to the, to the prison. And the bus ends up in an accident and ends up on the railroad tracks. And there's a, there's a train coming. And as the train's coming, everybody's trying to get out and scrambling out. But Richard Kimball is like, i got to help these guys. i got to help these other people out, even though the train's coming. He's not about himself. And it's really nice. And uh, he does this throughout the piece. And he, at one point, he's in the hospital and he's trying to get away. And he's he is stopped and he's he's disguised as an orderly or something. And he helps somebody. He helps somebody, right? He, and he risks getting caught by doing it, yeah. right? So he's always putting uh, other people in front of himself in that way. That's funny. That's my favorite scene in that movie. Yeah. Which is the movie that's kind of known for, for two big action sequences. Yeah. But, like, to me, the movie, I'm not a big fan of it, but... Yeah. The scene I really do like is that scene where he stops to help the, yeah. the person. I know you're not a fan of it, but I, if I could write that movie, I'd be 
totally happy. So, because <laughs> I think it really works. And I think that the years of experience that Roy Huggins had shows in that movie. Um, I don't think it's, otherwise, I think it's the kind of movie everybody thinks they could write. It's hard to have a character of change in a movie where the guy's a good guy. Like, how's he going to change? Yeah. And it's nice to have the, the pursuer be the person who changes. When Richard Kimball says, I didn't, I didn't kill my wife, to Gerard, Gerard's like, I don't care. Yeah. Right? Because it's not his job to care. My job is to catch you. But at the end, uh, he believes that Richard Kimball didn't, didn't kill his wife. Right. Um, and I think that it's all that pet the dog stuff that helped uh, cement that. And by the end... Um, Gerard's almost apologizing in a way. He doesn't quite, but he's almost apologizing for like, oh, I'm sorry you had to go through all this. Right. You know, I, I think it's really nice and it's nice that it has an arc and I think it rises above just an action movie because of it. Uh, let's hear from our sponsors, shall we? All right. Oh, yeah, good I think, call. I think if I'm not mistaken, I remember that Dr. Richard Kimball loved Hilliard's beer. Oh, he did. Yeah. yeah. It was his favorite. Yeah. And did you guys know that Hilliards is brewed here in Seattle, what? but it's ah. it's it's drunk everywhere. Interesting. Which that's probably, great. That's Good probably why them. Richard Kimball could get some. Yeah. Anyway, Hilliards Beer, visit their taproom Thursday through Sunday, and you can get more info on them at hilliardsbeer.com. And I think the Tommy Lee Jones character, I might be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure I always saw him chugging honest tea. He loves, he loves, yeah. He, he loves, loves the honest well, tea. Well, why wouldn't he, Chris? Yeah. Well, I don't know. He's honest. He is honest, right? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and he wants honest taste. That's right. And the great thing about honest tea is nature made it right. We put it in a bottle. Refreshingly honest, honest tea. Visit honesttea.com to find a distributor near you. Okay, that was interesting. Your next choice is Groundhog Day. Now, yeah. we just did an entire episode about Groundhog Day. So if, if people really want to hear your thoughts on that, they can go back and revisit that and, and dive into the... The into the nuances and, and subtleties of our conversation. But uh, I'll just recap it here anyway. Bill Murray plays Phil Connors, an arrogant and egocentric Pittsburgh TV weatherman who, during a uh, hated assignment covering the annual Groundhog Day event in Punxsutawney, finds himself in a time loop repeating the same day again and again. And uh, after indulging in hedonism and numerous suicide attempts, he begins to re-examine his life and priorities. The screenplay was written by Danny Rubin and Harold Ramis. Brian, no. Why this movie? Well, uh, I, you know, I, I often talk about the first acts and how important they are, but it has a really strong first act. And, uh, you know, he hates going, Bill Murray hates going to this, this town. Who thinks he's better? Yeah. He's, he's, he's talking about, I'm going to get a network job. I'm going to network job. I'm better than this. This is my last chance. Yeah. My last time doing this. Yeah. I'm not doing this anymore. Four years in a row. He's done it. He's tired of doing it. He doesn't want to do it anymore. Um, and he says, Somebody's going to see me doing this and think I don't have a future. Oh, he says that. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right, right, right. And so, uh, interestingly, uh, of course, he doesn't have a future. He's reliving the same day yeah. over and over again. And that's a really nice thing to plant that idea that um, doing this means I don't have a future. And to give him no future right. is really, it's, it's pretty sweet. It's, uh, it's, it's really good writing. Um, it didn't just randomly happen. You you know, you know, some people make up a story as they go along. And then if they make up a story as they go along, they don't write that. Right? Mm -hmm. right? Danny Rubin knew where the story was going. or And maybe that's uh, the, the product of drafts or whatever. But they knew to go back and make sure they put that stuff in. Yeah. So everything he doesn't want to happen to him is, is clear yeah. in the first act. And that's exactly what he's in a, his own personal hell. Uh, which is always a strong thing. If you put somebody exactly where they don't want to be, right? It, it will it will almost always make a good story. So um, and it's and for a comedy, yeah, it's instantly funny. It's instantly funny. What yeah. I don't, but he doesn't want to be there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as, as a friend of mine used to say, Gilligan's Island. I'm not wearing the dress. I'm not wearing the dress. Cut to Gilligan wearing the dress. <laughs> no, no, that's exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, yeah, put them in where they don't want to be, and it will it will it will uh, always work for you. So that's one of the great things about it. And then the character, um, you know, uh, learns his lesson, and and that stops this this repeating day thing. Yeah. But it's a really nice screenplay. Next up is Schindler's List. Uh, this is a film. This is the uh, this is the true story of Oscar Schindler, who's played by Liam Neeson. 
He's a German businessman who risks his own life in Nazi Germany by saving the lives of more than a thousand Jewish refugees during the Holocaust by employing them in his factories. And the screenplay was written by Stephen Zalian. Brian, how could Schindler's List end up on Brian's list? Did you see what I did there? (laughs) Did everybody see what I did there? Now that's good writing. (laughs) Uh well, Steve Zalian is um, is uh, an amazing screenwriter, and I mean, I'm amazed by I'm I'm really truly amazed by his 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 screenwriting abilities. And at the beginning of Schindler's List, there are chairs being set up to um, to to take names of these Jews in the ghetto and sort of keep track of them. And so you see a lot of names being typed on the list immediately in the movie. Um, it's a really nice thing. And all these people are coming up and saying their names and somebody's typing their names and people are saying their names. So right away you have a list of these Jewish people it, like immediately, um, which is which is a brilliant thing to start with. You don't have to start there. You can start anywhere, right? But he starts there. Um, really nice. And he also has this thing. And he, 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 he's really good at, and it's something I try to do. He's really good at linking one scene the next scene to the last scene or the next last scene to the, well, no, one scene to another. Right. So he'll, he'll end the scene with a question that gets answered in the next scene. And that way you are, you are hooked in and you are, you'll see the next scene. It's like somebody who's good at writing a chapter with a cliffhanger. Yeah. I was just going to say, I'll, I'll read the next chapter and then I'll go to sleep. Yeah. But then yeah. you've read like 10 yeah. chapters. Yeah. He's, he writes like that. So that, that, um, he connects things. There's one great scene where, where, uh, and you know, it, you could think of this as an editing thing or a directing thing, uh, but it's consistent with Steve Zalian's work. And uh, Steve, uh, Oscar Schindler's married, but his wife lives in some other town. And so, uh, so at Oscar Schindler's house, there's a knock at the door. A woman, half clothed, answers the door. Uh, or is about to answer the door, and Oscar's like, who is it? She opens the door, there's a woman standing there, and uh, it turns out it's Oscar Schindler's wife, you know? Right. And uh, anyway, so he, he just, he sleeps around with all these different women, and anyway, he, but his wife and him are hanging out, and they're having an okay time, and she wants to know, should I stay here? Uh, and he goes, well, it's up to you. And uh, she goes, well, if, if at one point, they're out on a, a sort of date, and a, and a major D thinks, doesn't know what to call her, like, oh, Miss... And she goes, Miss Schindler. And Mrs. Schindler is like, oh, okay, that's your wife. (laughs) And she, anyway, later she's saying, should I stay? And she says, I'll stay if uh, you can promise me that no Mater D will mistake me for anything but Mrs. Schindler. If if you can do that, I'll stay. Cut to her on a train. (laughs) (laughs) Right, yeah. yeah. (laughs) And he does that a lot. He's really, really good at it. Um, It's kind of an amazing skill. Um, he always knows where he's going. He, he, he has a way of cutting, making you make connections, yeah. making the audience yeah. make connections. Oh, I guess he said, no, that wasn't going to happen. Right. You right. fill in, you write the scene. He doesn't need to write it. He's really, really brilliant at that. Yeah. You know, and he's also good at taking Oscar Schindler from a guy who is all about making money and all about his own. In fact, there's a really great, beautifully written scene where, um, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, Ben Kingsley character, who is sort of his right hand man at this factory where he's you know exploiting Jewish workers, um, gets picked up uh, by the Nazis and he's on a train on his way to Krakow or something. So he gets picked up and so Schindler's got to find him. So he's like looking for his guy and finally he finds a guy and he pulls him off the train and when he and you know this guy was on his way to a death camp, so he's having an experience here like oh my god, I almost went to a death camp and. He's, he's apologizing and he's saying, I just, I forgot my papers and I didn't have my papers. I tried to tell him I worked for you. And, and Oscar Schindler is, is there and they're walking and you can see Ben Kingsley having this experience like, oh my God, I was almost killed. And Oscar Schindler says that was really stupid. And he's not really even paying attention. He goes, that was really stupid. I mean, imagine if I hadn't been here 10 minutes later, like, where would I, where would I be then? That's what he said. Oh, <laughs> where would I, I be? be? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. that's beautiful writing. Yeah. Right. Because that's where he is at that point in the story. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about him. And uh, then he makes a transition into into being another guy, and I think he I think he does that really well. He shows that guy the, the way he shows who that guy is is amazing to me. Yeah, uh, he's a, he's a he's brilliant. He's a brilliant writer. Well, and speaking of, 
Yes, your final he, he, film. he wrote he your was, final choice, yeah. which is uh, Searching for Bobby Fischer. Uh, this is a film about uh, a Josh, who's a young chess prodigy, and his parents are, are seeking to nurture his gift. So they hire a strict instructor, played also by Ben Kingsley. I guess Kingsley and, and uh, Zalian get along well, who uh, teaches the boy to be an aggressive uh, chess player like, like the legend Bobby Fischer. But Josh is also heavily influenced by speed chess hustler played by Lawrence Fishburne. The two coaches differ greatly in their approaches to the chess, and, and um, Josh eventually goes on to find his own path. So, Yeah, it's funny. Kingsley's in three of these movies. He's in Dave. Oh, right. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 And Lawrence year. Fishburne is in uh, Schindler's List. Oh, is he? No. No, no. That was, uh, that was Ray Fiennes. Uh, oh yeah, yeah often, you, often oh. mistaken. Yeah, oh wait, for Fishburne. Oh, I was thinking often of, mistaken. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so, but you know, uh, so, now I saw Searching for Bobby Fisher as a sneak preview. Uh, it was like the firm was playing, and it was like, and there's also this other movie you can stay and watch. And uh, I didn't like the firm, and this movie what <laughs> blew my mind, <laughs> and. Um, well, the bar was pretty low. <laughs> so, you know, but it's it's. I mean, it, we're just talking about the screenplay here, but the directing is is gorgeous, and the Conrad Hall's photography in that movie is out of control. It's really yeah. gorgeous, really gorgeous. Um, it's cut really nicely, um, but uh, from a screenwriting point of view, there's there's, there's he does an amazing job of. Um, and he directed it too. He did direct it, yeah. Um, he did an amazing job visually. Like his visual storytelling is out of control. And there's a, there's a great scene where, um, well, it's a it's a couple of scenes. It's sort of a, it's a sequence where um, the mom is saying to the the father in the story. Uh, Joan Allen is saying to Joe Mantegna that, oh, uh, Josh can play chess. And he's like, Josh can't play chess. He does not play chess. And so, so, so anyway, uh, Mantegna is going to play chess with his son to sort of prove that. So anyway, it's great because Mantegna gets these phone books and he puts these phone books on the right. chair for Josh. Right. And so you see Josh's feet and they're kind of uh, <laughs> like a little kids. They're way up in the air and sort of dangling, uh, dangling and stuff. And Josh looks really small on the table and they play a game of chess and and uh, Montaigne quickly beats him. Uh, and Josh wants to go do something else. Like, let's go to the dealership and get brochures or something. So, so uh, and then after the game is over, Montaigne says to his wife, Joan Allen, he goes, uh, he goes, well, you know, I know I should have let him win, you know. And uh, I gave him every opportunity. She's like, he wasn't trying to win. He doesn't want to beat his daddy. Don't you know that? It's like, oh, really? So he wants to play again. And the, he goes, he says to Josh, I really want you to try this time. I really, really, I, your mom doesn't think you were trying. He goes, I was trying. I know, but let's just go ahead. It's okay to beat me. And so it's really beautiful because the first thing Josh does is take the phone books down. And right. he drops yeah. them on the ground, yeah. right? All nicely visual. He drops the phone books. His, now his feet are on the ground, and now he looks much taller sitting in his chair. And uh, there's a series of cuts, and you can tell that Joe Montaigne is really thinking, and he doesn't know how to do this. And then there's a, sh there's a scene where you, it's like, oh, later in the movie, and Josh is playing, like, mousetrap with his sister. And so he's playing with his sister, and you hear from downstairs, Josh, it's your turn. <laughs> Josh <laughs> runs downstairs, moves a chess piece, <laughs> runs back yeah. downstairs to play mousetrap. Yeah. Crap. All visual, right? And then there's a scene where he's like on the phone. Josh is on the phone with a friend. He's like, oh, I can't. I can't. I'm playing chess with my dad. Chess, it's a game, right? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> it's like, Josh. So his, son, his dad calls him and you're in the kitchen and there's, they have a swinging door. Josh runs out without even thinking about it, moves a piece and runs back in to get on the phone with his friend. <laughs> like, just a minute. And he goes and he moves the piece. Beautiful. And then there's, this, and then, um, Josh says, uh, Josh is in a tub and he's kind of, he's taking a bath and he's bouncing a ball against the wall. And, uh, his dad says, uh, Josh, it's your turn. And he goes, uh, he says, Oh, did you move my horse? And he's like, <laughs> It's called the night, Josh. Yeah, my the other says, "Did you move my pawn?" And he goes, uh, "I moved a pawn." And Josh says, "Yeah, that one." <laughs> he goes, "Okay, now move my horse in front of this." And he's like, "It's called the night." And he's like, "Yeah, you know, you don't know, right?" And uh, 
And then he goes, uh, okay, can we go to the dealership now? <laughs> and his dad's like, the game's not over yet. And Josh is not even in the room. He goes, yes, it is. <laughs> Joe Mantegna looks at the board and realizes, oh, my God, <laughs> my son can play chess. But it's, it's the visuals are amazing. The yeah. fact that he told that with pictures is amazing. He told you how good that guy was. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Um, you know, and, and the, 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 the theme is really brilliant because um, Josh – there's a really great scene where where Josh has been playing uh, chess with guys in the park, speed chess with these guys in the park who played for drug money and all kinds of stuff. But Josh really likes playing in the park with these guys. And there's one guy, Vinny, who's kind of one of the mentors that Josh has. Uh, the guy lives in the park, well, but they don't know where he lives, but he spends all his time in the park. And uh, at one point, Josh says to his mother, uh, does Vinny live in the park? And she says, I... I be honest, I have no idea where he lives. And she's, and he says, well, I was just, you know, thinking that maybe he could, you know, stay on the top bunk <laughs> and I could stay here and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he has this plan for how he can live there. And Joan Allen's character, it's really great the way it's written and also the way it's acted. But she doesn't say, no, he can't live here. She says, she thinks about it for a second. She goes, you have a really good heart and that's the most important thing. And that's all she says. But that's all the thing is about is how good his heart is. Right. It's brilliant. It's all about how good a person he is. And at the end, when he's playing the the other kid who's like the chess guy, he offers when he's about. <laughs> the kid is so evil looking. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know he is. Like not in a scary way, but like in a children like of the a, corn way, like a Damien Owen yeah, kind yeah, of way. Is. Yeah, yeah. But you know, he he um, uh, at one point because it's set up that. Um, Ben Kingsley saying he doesn't want him to go to this competition. He goes, because these games are about winning and losing. That's all they're about. And it doesn't make sense to anybody. He's like, well, yeah, of course it's about winning and losing. Chess is not about that. And so in the end, chess, uh, he's playing chess with this guy, this kid, and Josh is about to win. And he, and he extends his hand right. and he says, yeah. he says, what are you doing? Because I'm offering you a draw. We can share the championship. But I'll just offer you a draw. And the kid's like, no. no. And so Josh wins. But he... He has a good heart, and that's the most important thing. And at, at one point, Kingsley is teaching uh, Josh how to play, and he goes, you know, you have to hate your opponent. Uh, they hate you. And, and uh, he said, but I don't. You know, and the whole thing is like, this is, the kid is the new Bobby Fisher, right? And he goes, well, Ben Kingsley says, well, Bobby Fisher uh, held the whole world in contempt. He thought everybody was beneath him. He held the whole world in contempt. And Josh says, I'm not him. <laughs> which is brilliant it's yeah. so brilliant I mean yeah. the guy can write like almost nobody can write like that the movie has one of my favorite lines of all time hmm. which is Joe Mantegna when he's talking with Joan Allen oh I know what you're talking about yeah yeah, yeah. and they're, I can't I can't even remember the scene but but she they're worried he's worried uh, because Josh has started to lose yeah and um, lose chess and he's uh and Joe Mantegna has been sort of meaner to him since he started losing. Right. And, and, right. and, and Joan Allen said, uh, or he says, he's afraid of losing. He's just in a slump. It happens. People get afraid and then they get more afraid. And Joan Allen says, he's not afraid of losing. He's afraid of losing your love. Right. And then your line, um, you, you can talk, you can say it if you want. It, I, it's the, she, she says, how many, how many baseball players um, are, are something like how many baseball players are afraid of disappointing their fathers every time they step up to bat. Yeah. Is this the right one? I think. And the, then she uh, says, all, she, he says all of them. Oh, no, no. Oh. No, I'm thinking of the, he's better at this than anything oh. I will ever be. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> well, the scene with Laura Linney. Oh, is that what it this is? This chess thing. Because she oh. says, I'm sure he's good at this chess thing. Because she's trying to get him oh, to come right, back to right, school. Oh, right, 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 right. It's like, this chess thing? Chess yeah. thing? <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah, That's yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. know how good he is at this? He's yeah. better at this than yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really yeah. it's really great. She's not very good in that scene. Oh and Lenny? Lenny? Yeah, but that's not what this I don't is about. That. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm not gonna nominate her then. Don't Should nominate. We could, I feel like we could do a whole podcast on this movie. It's but, coming up. I haven't seen it in twenty years. Well really? it's coming up in yeah. a few months. Good. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll watch it again. It's pretty pretty brilliant. Yeah. Love no, I remember movie. loving it and then hearing I, you talk about it. It's like, I want to watch it right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah I, 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 I thought it was cute. Yeah. No, I, I love this movie. Um, all right. Well, uh, just to recap again, your your five nominees that you will probably be, be scribbling down are 
Dave. Uh, fugitive. <laughs> fugitive. Groundhog Day. Schindler's List. Searching for Bobby Fischer. All great films. I'm a little. I, I haven't seen The Fugitive since it came out, so you should rewatch The Fugitive. Well, I will be, I'll be seeing it. I think in September. Okay, try and see it so. through, through my eyes and see if you see it differently. All right, can I borrow your glasses? You can. All right, <laughs> maybe sit right behind him in the theater. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That, that's probably the closest way you can see <laughs> yeah. his eyes. Actually, no, never mind. Or maybe next to him. Yeah, but anyway, all worth checking out. And um, if if anybody likes what you said here today, and they want to send you a, a tweet. Or if they hated what you said and they want to send you a tweet, oh, dare I'm going to yell Schindler's. tweet. Um, you know, I don't know my tweet. Thing. You don't know your Twitter thing? No, what, it's B McD 1950. Yeah. Is it 50? See, I don't know. 55? I don't know. See, I don't know. Well, hell, I don't know. Look for Brian McDonald <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> hey, if you can find him, he'll write you back. That's right. <laughs> Here's a challenge to all of our listeners. Here's his name. Uh, no, but people can't find you at Invisible Blog. Invisible Ink Blog. In, people can find you at Invisible Ink Blog. You're making it really they hard they, they for people to find Brian. <laughs> Come on. That's the way I like it. It's so mysterious. You're kind of the modern day Waldo. <laughs> Many people have said that. Anyway, thanks again for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, really great to hear your thoughts on these, these, these uh, I guess they're classics now. Yeah. <laughs> and so are we. Yeah. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors today, Honest Tea and Hilliard's Beer, both delicious drinks. If you're thirsty, let them quench your thirst. If you're a movie lover and would like to support us, you can subscribe to the 2020 Film Club. Your annual subscription gets you into 10 of our monthly For Your Consideration screenings here in Seattle, plus a ticket to our annual ceremony in February. It's uh, it's more than a hundred dollar value for only forty dollars to enroll. Just visit us at twenty twenty awards dot org and look for the subscriber link. And uh, you should just visit us at twenty twenty awards dot org because we're lonely over there. Uh, and until next time, remember it's never too late to start thinking about the past.